So like I say, it's always something. So I was in, in my wiring harness here, troubleshooting my backup camera, because it's not coming on. While I was poking around the wires, I got something, Got what I noticed something was hot. So let me show you what I got here. Get on the camera. That's almost 140 degrees, this little connector is. That's a problem. I believe this is my blow, powers my blower motor. But it wouldn't take much, much more. I could uh, be a real issue. You can see it's a little, a little light on it. Yeah. Well, something's wrong. I don't know what it is. But we're going to dig into it. And I'll, I'll let you know what I find. Alright, so I think you saw there just previously in that video where this connector was getting up, what did I say, 139 degrees? Because I realize that's, that probably is not enough to cause a fire, but in the past it must have been much hotter. Because look how much insulation has melted off that wire. I'm assuming when it was new, the insulation went all the way to the bottom, just like the, these other wires did, the other two. So all that has been melted off. So that's not good. So we're going to correct this problem so it doesn't happen anymore. You can see there's already a strand already broken. Maybe two. So I've got an ideal. I'm going to eliminate this spade connector altogether. You see it kind of got hot down in there. And then look at this one here that really got hot. So that's not good. So we're going to elim eliminate this altogether. I've got me, I think this is rated for 60 amps. Nice big brass bronze connections here so let's get to working on that I'm going to show you how I'm going to correct this problem so this doesn't happen anymore and a friend of mine he had the same problem happen to his his uh, wire was melting the same way and this is our ground wire actually this is ground and these are our two hots another thing I found is kind of odd they're fused differently um, this 30 amp wire in the middle it's fused by a 30 amp fuse out on the front firewall where the wire next to it is fused by uh, this fuse right here so it goes in the bottom I've got it pulled at the moment because I'm about to unhook all these wires and do some reconfiguring so I want to make sure there's no power anywhere but the biggest thing is the uh, our ground wire that's this feeds the blower motor and that pulls a lot of amperage yeah I, I used my little amp gauge a while ago and it was pulling 30 amps not 30 it was pulling 15 it's fused at 30 it was running about 15 amps so let's make a few changes and you can follow along all right first of all we want to set a little tang right here we want to push down on that to release the wire get your very small screwdriver like this reach inside there you'll see the tang sticking up i've done push both of those down once you do that then they just come right out Ta -da. And so uh, now I'm going to strip this back so I can, because I've got some wires broken. I need to get that corrected. Let's get that done. All right, so follow along. See what I've just done. See how pretty that is. So first of all, I stripped the wire back. Got rid of all that all damaged wire. Got back to some good copper. I sprayed my little deoxid on it. Boy, that's some good stuff. I think it's like $20 a can, but it'll last you forever. But it really took that oxidation off that wire, made it nice and shiny real quick. Now, this little piece I made here, let me show you what I did. I took this little device here, one of these little eyes, and I slid the um, insulator off of it, leaving me just a metal piece. Then I cut the eye off of it. So that's what you're looking at here. That used to be a little eye connector. And then I took my really good crimping tool. And these are... I've had this thing for years, one of the best crimping tools you ever get a hold of. Remember, see how you got it insulated and non-insulated. So that this is a non-insulated connector. If the insulation was still on it, then you'd crimp it using this crimper. But if it's non-insulated, use that. And you see how it puts a nice big dent in it. And the crease is on the back side. Let me show you how it's put together. Focus, focus. There you go. See, there's the crease. 
that makes for a really good connection. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, the reason I'm doing it like this, is because we're going to be screwing down in, into this, where the screw is going to be compressing that connection. And if I didn't do it this way, if I just stuck the wires in there and tightened it down, those wires are going to get cut and twisted and half of them broke off probably. This way, this screw will be tightened down, tightening down against this piece here, compressing it good and tight. So I'll have a super good connection. I'm going to do the same thing with these. Now, these are different because the connection is still really good. The crimp is, the factory crimp is really good shape. So I'm going to just come in here and snip the flat part off and then then screw my connectors right onto this part. I'll show you, show you that next. All right, a close shot. I think you got the idea. See what I'm doing? And where's my other wire? So I, I cut the flat spade off of it and left the factory crimp just like I did on the middle wire. And then I cranked that screw down on it good and tight. I really like how this thing is made. I'll, I'll put this in the in the notes in the video because it's very high quality. You can take a screwdriver and really crank down good and tight on it. So um, I'll get that other one on there and then I just got to do the same thing to these back wires. And you see how big and heavy these are. So now the, the white one remember is your ground and then we've got two hots coming in uh, which I've mentioned before. One's fused from the firewall, one's fused from the, the panel here on the, on the on the dash which is is odd but that's the way they did it. Alright I think you get the idea of what we're doing here. I'm just gonna show you I just took my screwdriver put inside that little notch right there give it a twist and it released that uh, connector of course I've already cut the end of, end of it off right there so it's going to be just this piece it's already got a good factory crimp and I'll put that in my new is that called termination block I think it is and screw down on it good and tight so I just got three more wires to go and I'll uh, put the fuses back in and give it a test run all right, you see my connections are made. Everything's good and strong. And what I've done, because I got this little protector strip here to protect the wire, and I'm going to use my original screw hole from that original plastic piece. I just bent this down at an angle, so that uh, keeps from stressing the wires out. The wires be right there. Nothing's stressed. Nothing's pushing hard on any metal or anything. So I got me a little screw to put in there and. Get it, we'll get it all snugged up. All right, now this is the odd part. This took a while for me to figure out, try to track down. But I had one wire that was staying hot all the time, and it took a while to figure out where it was fused at. Well, actually, it's fused right here, this lower 30 amp. And it's, but it's labeled wrong. See, from the factory, it says blower. Put my finger at there you go. It says by the factory, this is supposed to be the blower fuse, but it's not on mine. It does not control the blower. Mine, what controls the blower for us, is the lower 30 amp fuse, which these also power these auxiliary studs. Because you see here, you got auxiliary A and auxiliary B. That's auxiliary A, that's auxiliary B. Those are also controlled by these large 30 amp fuses. So now to put this in, our blower motor should work. All right, test one. Here we go. Blower motor is blowing. Now we shouldn't have any more hot wires. I'm gonna do a little amp load testing, show you what these do. So this is our ground wire. It's a blue and white wire. That is our ground to the blower motor. It's pulling 16 amps. You can tell when you change your speeds, of course it drops. 5 amps. No, it's just down to 3 amps, the lowest setting. So there we go. You know what that does. Okay, I think I'm now I'm figuring out why we have two fuses on this thing. So like this wire here, the, the, the solid blue wire, Notice when we get on high, we're like 16 amps. As soon as we go in the lower settings, it drops off to nothing. So that wire, it is only energized when you're on full speed high. So, uh, so I guess that they have one wire that controls the fan when it's on high. Then they have another wire that controls the fan 
anything but high uh, through the lower speeds. So let me show you. Let's go to our next wire. Okay, so here's our our last wire, the black one. So you notice see we're on high. We don't get much amp draw at all. We drop it down a speed. Then we see got nine amps. Then we got five amps. It drops on down. So that kind of makes sense. That's why they're doing that. And uh, I got the little. This is pretty handy here. I'm trying to get it. Get a good good view of it here. That might be handy for you. I, I got this out of the service manual somewhere. But if you want to do a screenshot, that might come in handy for you if you're trying to trick. You see all my little notes. I drew all those lines and stuff trying to figure this thing out. What was going where, what was doing what, what wire handled what speed. You can see all my little notes here. I like to put up a wire that's low. And then we have second, red wires for our third speed. Four is our high speed. And then you can see here's our, um, here's our relay. So here's our, our blower relay. And I did notice the outside relay stays hot all the time. So I believe the one fuse, it's just like a pass through. It just goes straight on through directly to the blower motor. But then any other times we have, we need any other speed besides high speed, we're going through the resistor connector. So let me go out, out front and show you some of these components. And also let me show you this side in case you want to get a screenshot of this. This shows all the vacuum routing and what they do. Might be handy for you to know what port is open when. I've never had to repair have any problems so far with with my with my vacuum switches or anything like that on the dash air but that's why i do keep this piece of paper under that under the dash at all times so if i ever have a problem i got a schematic to start troubleshooting from all right let's go out front show you some components okay so here's our relay i believe it's this blue wire it stays hot all the time and it's just a pass through it goes directly through and feeds the blower motor and there's a little resistor pack there it gives us our different speeds there's like coils of wire on the inside different lengths of wire to create more resistance to make the blower run slower and slower so there you go it's a couple components help you figure out what's what you need to troubleshoot this thing so now that i got this wiring took care of i don't worry about that no more i got to thinking you know that could have been bad you know it got so hot at some point in time it was melting that insulation and, you know, if we're going to have an electrical fire, this most likely going to be in the dash. But, you know, look at this spaghetti of mess of wires. If something got pinched, you know, that's why I'm always mindful of where these wires are going. When you close this down, you know, those pieces like this come down. If you've got something pinched back here in the hinge, because that's why we have fuses. But still, you never know. Best to be safe than sorry. So I got to thinking, well, what if that... That melted insulation had really started smoking and giving me trouble and started to fire. I thought it would be nice to have a sort of an early warning system. I thought, well, why don't I just put a smoke detector in here? That would do it. If we had the least bit of smoldering going on, that smoke detector would get go off, give me a chance to nip it in the bud, so to say. Open up the door and, or open up the, the dash and see what the heck is going on. And smoke detectors are cheap enough. I think it's like four or five bucks at Walmart. So... Uh, so I thought, okay, the best place to put this would be, of course, at the highest point. And the highest point is this little arch here. And so I got me a piece of Velcro on the back. So I'm going to reach up in there and find this spot uh, right up in there somewhere to attach it. So I think that'd be a good idea. Ain't going to cost me much and uh, might save me some grief in the future if we ever had it. Did, did have any kind of electrical issues while driving down the road or parked or whatever. If you're, if you're sleeping and you hear an alarm go off, you can come up here and see what the heck's going on. All right, I found a good spot to put it. I put it right on the back side of this right here. So if that way I have gravity holding it down. I don't have to worry about it pulling loose from the, the Velcro. Let's see if you can see it. Right there she is. Tucked up in there nice and pretty. So, uh... If there's any kind of smoldering going on, we'll have an early warning system at Sucker. Hopefully it will go off and I can take care of any problems that, that may occur in the future. So I got to thinking, after I put that smoke detector there under the dashboard, I, I got to wondering, I wonder how common is electrical fires for RVs? So I looked it up and it says 35% of all RV fires are electrical in nature. So I got to thinking, well, where else 
would be a good idea to put a smoke detector. So I thought, well, here's a prime example. This is my little area here that I keep. I got my three Battleborn batteries. I got my solar charger. I got my inverter here, the engine starting battery. I've got a whole lot going on in this one compartment. So I thought, man, if, if there ever was going to be a fire, this is a good candidate. So I put me in a smoke detector. I thought that'd be a good idea. And I thought there was one more spot too, was back in the back where our main main cables come in. So back here where our main wires come in, the 50 amp service, the, the transfer switch, and I got that uh, old electrical management system. It's buried in there, uh, you know, in case there's a low voltage. But this, this this device right here, I forget exactly the name of it, Progressive Dynamics or something, I think. But uh, if anything. In this box was to go haywire, start shorting, start smoldering. Now I got me smoke detector, smoke detector here also. So cheap insurance, something to keep in mind, something you can do real easy. Well, it just dawned on me, you know, probably the most important place for a dang smoke detector is on in the back of these refrigerators. Now I've got the residential fridge, so it's less likely to have an issue. But especially if you happen to have a gas absorption propane refrigerator still in your RV. You know, they're, they can be so prone for fires, which is pretty scary. And I got a video where I talk about that and some safety options you can take with fire suppression and, and something called a fridge defend that you can help uh, lessen your chances of, of a fire. But that seems to be pretty common. But um, I ran out of smoke detectors, so next trip to Walmart, I'll give me one more and I'll probably mount it up in here up high. Just use, use, just use Velcro, stick it up in there in its place, just in case. So... Uh, I thought that might be a another good tip for, for a few dollars. Like I said, it's cheap insurance. So while we're talking about smoke detectors, I thought I'd talk about fire extinguishers. We've got two in the RV, but did you know you're supposed to shake these every 30 days? Turn them up, upside down, give them a good shape, keep that powder loose. Um, don't know if everybody does that or not, but it's recommended. Uh, I was also doing some reading, I thought I mentioned this, I think about the 35% of RV fires are electrical in nature. Um, but we keep two fire extinguishers, I, I keep keep one here at the door, and we keep the other one back here in the bedroom, right here by the door. It stays clamped right there, in case anything happens, we're in the bedroom in the middle of the night, we got a chance to, to put out the fire or get out. The other thing is think about getting out of your RV. You know, because we have, a, you know, there, there's the, our, that's our fire escape window right there. And I did it one time, just as an experiment, what it would be like to try to get out quickly. And I got out, but it wasn't fun, and it hurt <laughs> crawling out that window, going down across that metal frame. So just something to think about. I'll have to be a, probably be a, another video that we could do in, in the future, probably. But while I was thinking about this, I called a buddy of mine who is the state fire marshal for Kentucky. And I asked him some questions about RVs and what he recommended. I told him what I had. These, I think they're like the four or five pound extinguishers. He would, he said, I, he would recommend a minimum of a, of a ten pound because these things empty really quick. He said. Um, and I also was reading online where they recommended, you know, each RV should have at least two fire extinguishers and then one outside in an unlocked compartment. So I'm thinking that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to get me, I'm going to upgrade me maybe to a ten pound extinguisher. I'll put it right there. And I'll take one of these smaller ones and store it outside. Usually uh, where our propane tank is, uh, I never lock that door. So I can, uh, I'm going to just show you. So here's my plan. Because I never keep, I never have this locked. So in case you need to get to the propane quickly for whatever reason, I just put me one of the fire extinguishers right here and keep it stored. That way it'd be easy access. So something for us all to think about and keep things safe. So there's one more thing I want to address while I'm under here. Over the years, I keep adding accessories and I always need a little extra power. So oh, I've been jumping off this large wire because this, this is a 20 amp fused wire that feeds the the um, cigarette lighter, which I in turn, only thing I, I plug it, of course we never use a cigarette lighter, but I do power these little accessories. We got these little USB phone chargers and different things. So we're never drawing near 20 amps or anything. It's just, uh, LED lights like this little thing here indicator some some different stuff uh, I'll Power my fuel gauge off of it. So I got this little cluster of wires, which is a mess I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean this up get rid of all this get rid of this wire nut So my ideal is to use this as a junction box I'm gonna take the large heavy wire from the factory. That's 20 amp protected Mount it to this large nut then I'll jump off and I can put it I can fuse individual circuits from that I think that'll be a safer 
little bit better alternative and so, so I don't have that cluster of wires it's just a mess I can do better than that all right just to recap we got rid of this piece of plastic that was melting on me giving me trouble got all that done that looks good I went in here and all my little individual wires I kind of had a mess I remember I had that little uh, wire nut tying all my hots together I got the, everything all separated I like these little devices here you can get them on Amazon they're pretty pretty nice so if you blow a fuse it tells you as soon as the fuse blows it lights up and so I got each item individually fused like my CB they got my, my fuel gauge which that's right there so I can monitor my fuel pressure as we're going down the road um, also my temperature alarm which I added to the engine so the engine overheats and the alarm will go off and tell me what's going on which I actually don't knew that I don't even need that now because now I've got this scan gauge 2 or not the scan gauge this is the new scan gauge 3 it, it, it has an alarm built into it I got a new video coming on in it soon um, what else we got what I do it's okay the fuel gauge my front LED temperature light yeah I got like a I got some LED lights that run up front I got them so I got this set of fuses here on this block is is switched so this only gets hot when the key is on this block up here is hot all the time that's what powers the my, my um, cigarette lighters which like like runs my cameras and different stuff so sometimes I want my cameras on at all times like with my LED I want it on sometimes I'll, I'll park the RV and just at night let those LEDs run through the night and I don't have to worry about having the ignition switch on and anyhow and I got saved little notes here I put them back in there so I can keep up with everything remember how how that how strange this is the way it's fused you got one fuse out on the firewall and one fuse is in here on our in, inside the well you know right over there that 30 amp at the bottom that silver one so something to, something to keep in mind if you ever uh, have issues with your blower motor and it's not working right we got two fuses to deal with so I'll keep that tucked under here just like that close it all up anyways I guess that project is over with maybe you can poke into your dashboard hopefully you got a dash it lifts up like this I really like these some are, are not you got to just access them through the front not as easy I, I like this design but you just just got to be mindful when you close this up make sure you got no wires back here in this hinge nothing gets pinched just give it a good look around good good once over make sure everything looks looks well so keep everything safe and clean. Anyhow, thanks for watching. Have a blessed day. See you, bye.